Dear friends, it is indeed a very, very happy moment for us, for me and for my wife to join with you in this worship service after a break of few years. And it is indeed to see many of you and, to, and we believe that we will have chances to talk with every one of you after the worship service. I thank God for this wonderful opportunity to come and join with you in this worship service. And I also thank the pastor, Reverend Benjamin, for having invited me and granted me this wonderful occasion to share God's words with you. I also greet and thank the secretary, treasurer, and members of all LCC, all LCC members, and all the leaders of this congregation. And I hope that this day will be a great day because this day is the beginning of a new week and also we'll be begin a new month in this week. And I hope and believe that the Lord who has guided you and guided us in the past will continue to go before us and he will give us focus and he will give us courage and confidence to do his work every day. And now before we go into the meditation, shall we all bow our heads in prayer. Gracious God, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful occasion that you have given us to come into your sanctuary and to meditate on your words. And we know, Lord, that your words have power and potentiality and it will not return with empty emptiness and it will fulfill and accomplish the task for which you have sent the words out. Even now, Lord, as we are in your presence, speak to us. We thank you, Lord, for the family that you have granted us. Help us, Lord, to be good stewards and faithful partners and faithful members of your church. Continue to teach us and speak with us. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Dear friends, we are living in a world a world that is growing day by day in many wickedness and in evil thinking and evil action. And all this wickedness and these evil practices are gradually understood as the growth and it is a modernity. We talk about modern world and thereby we just cancel the very many privileges and ethical values that are laid down before us. And many times the follies of this world is appreciated and glorified. And in this context that we are come into the presence of God to renew our calling, renew our responsibilities, renew our commitment not only in the church but in the family as such. As a family members, as husband and spouse, wife and spouses, what is a commitment? Am I a faithful husband? Am I a faithful wife? And if I am faithful to my husband and my wife, then I must be faithful to God. Faithfulness leads from one frontier to another. If you are unfaithful to your spouse, then naturally you will be unfaithful to, to God himself and to God. And dear friends, therefore this morning, the theme that is given to us for meditation is honor marriage. And for that, four readings were read to us this morning. And for our meditation, I chosen a passage, a passage that was a dialogue, a discussion, and that we find in the Gospel according to St. Mark, chapter 10, verse 2 to 9. May I request you to open your Bibles so that as and when we refer this particular passage, you may read for our own benefit. And when we read Mark's Gospel, chapter 10, verses 2 to 9, the very verses are found in another Gospel. That is in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 19, verse 3 following. And we read this 10th chapter that Jesus Christ was returning 
from Galilee, region of Galilee, verse number one tells us that Jesus was traveling back to this Judea region. And before that, we read that he was in the region of Galilee. And as he was entering into the region of Judea, he met and he encountered few people. And this is narrated here. Mark gives, uh, gives it as a narration. And this narration might be, many people may call it as personal thing. But there is nothing known as personal. We are not islands. We are living relationship. We are not living in isolation. And therefore, we are in relationship and we are in contact. And therefore, this passage, even though it talks about individual morality, spirituality, and this passage tells us how much I want, first thing is, honor God, God's word. How much I fear God. Do I have fear of God in my life? This, this slave girl, Agar said, you are the Lord who sees me. Do we have that kind of fear? God is always watching over me. He is watching over me, all my motives, my actions and everything. And therefore, this particular passage is telling us, do we have the fear of God in my life, in the life of my, in, in my family, and in all my dealings? If there is no fear of God, sure indeed, wickedness prevails in every individual's life. If you don't obey God, if you don't obey God's word, then sure indeed, we are gone astray. And this passage tells us that how much we fear God. Fear of God always leads us to another frontier, obeying God's word, trusting in God's word. And this man, Paul said, I know whom I have believed. And that will give you, if you have the fear of God, it will give you a kind of moral, moral support, energy, and strength. And you can very well say that I know whom I have believed. And this morning as we read this particular passage, we come across this in Mark's, Matthew, um, Mark's Gospel, chapter 10, verse 2 following, as Jesus was entering into the region of Judea, he was encountered uh, by a group of Pharisees. Pharisees are known as perfectionists. They want to do everything perfect. Uh, they want to keep everything in an order. They want to do it in a particular way. But sure indeed, they interpreted the law, but I'm very sure they, in uh, they interpreted the law, but how far they have followed the laws of God. They said they interpreted the commandment, honor your parents. But instead they interpreted, they said, you can offer a kind of offering in the temple, kurban, that's known as kurban, and thereby you need not honor and you need not support your parents at their older age. What a quite contrary interpretation. God decided that every child and every children that got to, they got to honor the parents. But this new interpretation from Pharisees, the astrayed common Jew. And these particular people, and they known as perfectionists, came and asked Jesus Christ certain questions. And this is a dialogue. The dialogue, and it's, a, it's written in narrative form. In verse number two, we come across this Pharisees came and asked. In verse number two, and verse number three, and subsequent verses thereof. The particular concern of the Pharisees were not of the marriage. Look at the words, how they what are the words they are using? They use the word that is not the intention of God. What is God's intention? 
in, in, uh, in contrary to that, these Pharisees using the word, and this word came out of their heart. And what was the question? They asked the simple question, it's not a simple question, it is lawful for a man to divorce his wife. If you read the dialogue, Jesus never used the word divorce. Whereas these Pharisees use the word divorce. And this means the evil nature of human heart. Every human heart is very, very evil. We want to understand the evilness of human heart. We need to go back to the account written in the Genesis account. Genesis chapter 6. We come across um, peculiar, it's not a peculiar, it depicts the nature of human heart. It tells how ungodly the human heart, human life is. This human life, this Genesis chapter 6 narrates something quite unusual, quite contrary to human nature. And in this particular chapter, was chapter 6, verse 5 and 6, we come across that every, the, the human heart by its nature, very, very evil. Evil thinking comes out of the heart. Evil actions comes out of human heart. If we read verse 5 in chapter 6, it talks about that human heart is very, very evil. And in verse number 6, we come across that God was grieved over creating human. Dear friends, what is in your heart? Whatever you, what fills your heart will come out of your mouth. What is in your heart will be spelt out by words. Here, these Pharisees, their hearts were filled with negative ideas. Not only negative ideas, contrary to God's plan. God, when he created the world, and he never used the word divorce. But on the other hand, God created the great institution. The institution of marriage should be kept as holy. The institution of marriage was created by God, and that's the first institution created by God. If you read chapter 2 in Genesis, it reads like this. Chapter 2 verse of Genesis, verses we come across in verses the 20, uh, 24, 23, 23 is the comment from this man Adam. When God created a woman, he um, God brought that woman before Adam and Adam talked this word. In verse 23, he says that she'll be called, she, since she emerged from man, she'll be called as woman and so on and so forth. Whereas the words of God comes here in 24 and it tells us that in, in, the, in this way we read, therefore a man uh, shall leave his uh, father and mother and cling to his wife and they become one flesh. A new understanding. What is marriage? Becoming one flesh. One flesh means what? One flesh means it is they become two become one. Normally we say in mathematics one plus one is equal to two. But the Bible tells us one plus one is equal to one. How that could be? That, that the underlying current is that they are not two different people. They are one and the same. And therefore, we got to understand that they think unanimously. One, one thinking. Same kind of thinking. One thought and mind. There is no duality. What is marriage? Marriage is two different persons coming together and they are becoming one. One in their action, one in their thinking, and one in their perception. Dear friends, Jesus Christ 
is telling us and pointing out this wonderful fact that as a married people and those who are going to get married, God is saying that you are no longer two, but one. That means think alike, work alike, and that needs quite a lot of understanding, quite a lot of listening. We are living in a world where we seldom listen. We want to give advice. We want to give directions. But here, to become one means that you need to spend time in listening. How much time do you spend in listening to the words of your spouse? And here, this particular passage of Mark chapter 10, verse 2, Pharisees ask the question whether it is lawful for a man to divorce his wife. This is not God's plan in creation. He created in Christian purity the institution of marriage. As I said earlier, because of the wickedness of human heart, the perverted mind, the sinful heart, diverse human mind from God's word to their own nature. Dear friends, this question comes to us very, very vivid. Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife is in contrary to God's plan. God never intended, God never planned that there must be a divorce. But he said, they shall become one. One in flesh, one in thinking, one in perception. And this particular passage tells us the condition of a family. What kind of family that we lead? Do we have oneness of mind? If we need oneness of mind, then the altar must be set right. What is the altar? We read a very wonderful incident where Elijah, before offering sacrifice at the Mount Carmel, he repaid at the altar of God. And he, after repairing the altar, he offered the sacrifice. The altar of every family is their prayer altar. How powerful is your family altar? Have you repaid your family altar? We, may, we are all human beings. We are prone for committing mistakes. But when we come before the Lord, when we come before the Lord to offer prayer, the Lord wants us that we should repair our family altar. If I have unforgiving spirit of my wife, my children, God is telling us, repair your altar. Make it straight, make it perfect. The family altar got to be strengthened. And therefore, it is not God's intention as the Pharisees asked the question. God's intention was that they shall be one and they shall one flesh. And as we go, this particular passage, Mark chapter 2 verse 3, says that Jesus told them what Moses has said. And they repeated in verse number 4 what Moses has commanded them. And Jesus answered that because of the hardness of your heart, he gave you this commandment. Why did Jesus Christ say hardness of your heart? Hardening your heart. What is hardening your heart or hardening my heart? And that is that it becomes like a rock without feeling, without any kind of um, understanding. It is insipidness, dead. A dead uh, body can never experience feeling. That kind of experience. Hardness of heart is that I and you do not have any kind of feeling. And it, that is to say, no guilt feeling at all. No feeling. That is hardness of heart. And we can say and we can read the same thing in the life of the people of Israel as they were traveling in the wilderness of Sinai when this godly man, Moses, went up into the mountain to receive 
God's commandment. He was there in God's presence. And what was happening in the camp? There is quite ungodly things were happening. Dear friends, ungodliness is the hardening of heart. If I don't fear God, that means that you don't have feeling. You don't have guilt feeling. You don't have anything to regret upon. Look at this man, David. When he committed sin, he, he was pointed out by this prophet, and then he wrote the psalm. He sang the song, Psalm 51, where he confessed the sin. Dear friends, that is a heart full of feeling. And when, he, when the prophet said he's committed sin, he just bowed on and he knelt down before God and he confessed the sin. But whereas the life of the people of Israel, they took it for granted. Their hearts were like solid rock. Nothing could penetrate into their mind. Their thoughts and hearts were corrupt because of the evilness. The flesh, the flesh dominated them. Dear friends, Jesus said, Moses gave the command because of the hardness. Your heart's face so like a rock and without a feeling, feeling of guilt. And your heart can never experience that such kind of feeling. And therefore, he gave an alternative. And even in the alternative, we could see the grace of God and the compassion of God that anyone can never divorce his wife unless and until there is an adulterous action, activity. Dear friends, it is even God's heart is very, very soft and very loving and compassionate. He tells us how much he loves us by the life of this man, Hosea. If time promise this day, go and read the book of Hosea. Hosea was a living example, a walking, a mobile example to tell and to portray how God loves. God said to Hosea, go and marry an adulterous woman. And this man went and married. And thereby God said, see, I love you, my people, Israel. Even though you go astray, and you follow wicked ways, and you follow the ways of the world, still I love you. You are adulterous generation, but still I love you. Dear friends, God's plan and Moses also will reiterate that it is not God's plan for divorce. Today we are living in a world, the so-called modern world. And if anything is not agreeing with me, with my spouse, I simply go to the civil court and institute a civil um, um, case or, so that my, my marriage could be dissolved. But this is not what God's intention. God never intended in that way. And whenever we print the invitation card, we write, um, we print a verse from the Bible. The Bible, that, that verse comes from the Genesis account, Genesis chapter 24, where in which Laban and Bethuel said, this things proceeded from the Lord. And we say that this marriage has come from the Lord. My dear parents, my dear children, this one question I want to ask you. If you are solemnly and faithfully agree that the wedding comes from the Lord, then where is the room for divorce? If you think and if you believe that this marriage is come from the Lord, and where is the option? Other option? You may not find it. It is not the providence of God. It is not in the mind of God. And that is the cunning, crude way that the evil one, the Satan has generated in the life of the people. As I pointed out earlier, human heart was corrupted. Because of the corruption, human beings think in a different manner. Dear friends, 
And that's why I told in the beginning of the uh, sermon, fear of God. If we fear God, and I will obey God's word. Dear friends, do we have fear of God in our family? And we have quite a number of personalities, a number of families in the Bible. It tells us, the families tells us how they were led by God, how they were protected by God, as long as they abide by God's word. And we know that Lot was saved from the catastrophe and the Sodom and Gomorrah. So also, this man, Nova, was safeguarded. And I know a particular family, you know that, atom, atom bomb was uh, uh, th thrown into the city, Nagasaki, Hiroshima. And I heard, I, uh, you know I, I did not meet them in person, I met the son-in-law of that particular family. And three days prayer to the bombing, God, and it's a Christian family, it's, a, it's Japan, Japanese family. And God told the mother, they, they did not have the head of the family, father is, was no more, and the mother, and there were two, three children. And God said to the mother to go away from Hiroshima. And she said, how can I go? Here I have my property, my house, and all things I have. But the compelling force of God took her by hand along with the daughter and she left and she go, went into the mountains. And after a day, there was bomb, a bombing of nuclear weapon and the whole city was raised. God protects his people as long as we obey God's word. Do you obey God's word? God will protect you from all kind of catastrophes. Whatever it may be, he will protect. In God, there is no break in the marriage. There is no setting aside of marriage. God, in his divine mercy, has instituted marriage that it will last long until the very end. My dear friends, this morning, as we are meditating, it is it is not God's plan. If you believe that the marriage comes from God, then obey God. Whatever he says, obey. In order to obey, it needs humility. What is humility? Even to bow down, wash the feet. Many times we believe that husbands are the boss of the home and wives are the domestic uh, servants of the family. But that's what God never intended. If we read the Bible in a clear manner, and God says that I will make a suitable helpmate. If you read Genesis 2, um, uh, we find after verse 6, we find that God said, let us make a suitable helpmate to this man. And therefore, marriage is in which you find suitable helpmate. Dear friends, as we are in the family life, we are complimenting one another. It is not competition, not commanding one another. It is complimenting, enriching one another. And this morning, as we are in the presence of God, God is telling us how much you compliment your wife in everyday work. How much you assist your wife in, in everyday chorus of your family, complimenting one another. This particular passage goes on to say in, 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 the, in Mark's Gospel, chapter 10, verse 2, um, we come across Jesus Christ reiterates what was said by God in Genesis 2. And we read in um, Verse number six, from the beginning of creation, God made them man and uh, male and female. Verse seven, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and join 
to his wife and the, the, the two shall become one flesh, flesh. And the last portion uh, comes as a joiner. The last portion comes like this. So they are no longer two, uh, but one flesh. Therefore, what God joined together, let no man put asunder. The last phrase is coined by Jesus Christ. The first one is said by God at the Garden of Eden. The last portion comes to us when Jesus Christ was encountered by Pharisees and he said, what God joined together, let no man put asunder. Putting asunder is, comes out of various reasons. And we are from different psychological, economical background. Our brought up may be different from a spouse, but the Bible says, the Lord tells in a very clear manner, therefore, what God joined together, it is God who joined together. When I and my stood before God, when we gave a pledge and vow, and it is to God that we shall live together as long as we both, as long both shall live in all kind of situation. And that is precisely the same. What God joined together, let no man put asunder. This is what God's intention. If you are honoring God, then as a parent, I need to prepare my children for the holy matrimony, teaching them, inculcating the values in the family, the values of marriage, marriage adjustment, marriage complement in the, uh, complementing each other. We need to inculcate and teach our children so that they will understand the plan of God in our children's life. Dear friends, as we live in this earth, many things we may here, we may hear that there are quite a number of divorce cases in the uh, legal, uh, in the court of law, family court. But that need not to disturb us. We believe that God established your family and my family with a purpose and for a purpose. He has a great purpose. He wants to accomplish that purpose through you and me. And if you fail in doing that, who else will come and do? And that question lingers, lingers large in our mind. If I fail, then who else will do? If I do not follow what God has said in my family, in my family relationship, if I do not forgive my wife, if I do not forgive my husband, who will come and forgive my husband and my wife? And this is what God wants to teach us every day in our life. God wants us to be intact as a family, one in the family, one in thinking, one in action, and thereby becoming a, a yeast, yeast that, that, um, um, or a salt of the world, and yeast to the, um, the, the floor. Dear friends, let the good God continue to lead us, continue to guide us, so that each day we understand God's plan in our life. And before I conclude, I just want to reiterate that God's plan, that you, are, um, that you shall become a family. And you may think that you're so holy and your source is not, uh, not so, so holy as you are. You may think that you are so close to God. Your spouse is not so close to God. And that's why God has united you together. Through your faith, through your obedience, through your faithful life to God, God wants to transform your spouse. Dear friends, that's what Paul is also saying in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And as we lead our family in this world. May the good Lord continue to teach us. May the family altar be strengthened every day. May we have the heart to obey God's voice. 
May we have the courage to obey God's voice. May we put a hand in the hand of God so that we walk every day along with Jesus Christ in fulfilling the demands of Jesus Christ in everyday life. May the good Lord bless us all. Amen. Shall we pray? Good God our Father, thank you, Lord, for instituting the institution of marriage. The institution of marriage is pristine, pure. But Lord, the human beings, they have made it wicked because of the thinking and action. You intended that both male and female shall be joined together in holy matrimony and they shall become one. Grant us the serenity. Grant, grant us the wisdom and understanding to discern your will, to understand your plan. Gracious Lord, we are not many in India, only few Christians, less than three persons. And less than three persons, you have placed us in various junctures of, um, of the society and various places in, the, in, the, in this country. Grant us, Lord, as a family, help us to live out as your children and show what a Christian family is and thereby showing your grace, compassion, and love to all human beings. Continue to teach us, Master. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.